uh, we are now in this uh, very interesting session uh, the uh, population stabilization so without losing much of the time uh, we are going to start the proceedings of this very important session and uh, we begin with uh, i think i'm not going to introduce the theme because that will automatically come during the discussion and the straight way we are going to that will be set the context of uh, a video one minute video straight way uh, so that uh, uh, we set the context the session will be of course we have uh, encroached upon the time by the plenary but you are free to take your oh, i think 10 minutes for each speakers uh, there will be three rounds of uh, maybe two to minutes each uh, for the question round and then this video as well there are a few polling questions as well so i would request archana to project the video the global population is 7.8 billion and growing our planet is in crisis how can we secure a sustainable future India has taken giant strides in spreading awareness and enhancing adoption of family planning techniques while also ensuring healthier lives for its citizens. The population explosion is a burning issue before every nation of the world. It is also an economic problem and a social problem. Watch policymakers and experts debate solutions. The planet is dying and it's our duty to keep the planet alive. Let's all act now. Do you believe that India is on the right track? On mission sustainability, population versus planet, a thought leadership conclave. At this time on Wheel, world is one. We don't have the time to waste. We still have coral reefs. We've still got forests around the world. Now's the time to save them. If we continue like we are, they're going to be lost. We need to figure out how to live in harmony with planet Earth. It's for not only my grandson, but it's for all of yours. The hope is that people will realize we're all in it together. Every morning when I get up, I have hope. So this uh, sets the tone, uh, mission sustainability, population versus planet. Uh, today, in fact, we would be uh, discussing role of education in population stabilization. Uh, I think before I go through uh, the, uh, this session, let me introduce you to our uh, experts today. Uh, first, uh, you all know about Terry Sparr, who is the founder director of Earth Overshoot. And uh, he is a Philadelphia-based ecologist, environment activist, and documentary filmmaker. In fact, we already introduced him last, uh, yesterday. And then we have uh, K.S. James, director and senior professor at International Institute of Population Sciences, Mumbai, a uh, very experienced person, uh, we will hear him. And then we have Sangamitra Singh. She is from Population Foundation of India, a very well-known think tank uh, on population stabilization. We have Mr. Pradeep Berman, chairperson of Mobius Foundation. In fact, whatever population initiatives that are with the Mobius Foundation, he is the inspiration behind this. A uh, straight way, what I would like to begin this session with asking a few questions uh, with the panelists, all the three distinguished panelists, and they have two minutes each to respond to these questions. Uh, let me begin with question number one. What, in your opinion, is the real state of affairs with respect to population stabilization, policies, practices, and what are the bottlenecks? 
in implementation of those policies. So can we go straight away to uh, Mr. Terry Spire from Earth Overshoot? Uh, uh, good, uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Bush and, uh, and uh, Mr. Berman as well for uh, putting on this fantastic event. Um, I, the, I, the, I guess the challenges and the bottlenecks that I see is that um, it's certainly a global problem, just like climate change uh, overshoot is and, and unsustainable population growth in many countries, but it's very difficult to get roughly 200 countries to come together and work together on this issue because every country has you know, different politics, it has a different culture, it has uh, different economies and uh, different beliefs. And so um, I, I look at this as something that is aware, it needs to be uh, obviously uh, uh, educated and, and, and awareness to, to all, you know, all countries and all citizens, uh, but each country has to uh, come to terms with it and have uh, enough people uh, you know, bringing this up to leadership to say, we really need to address this issue. So it's up to you and I and everybody in our own countries to you know, focus on this issue and uh, get leadership in those countries to uh, make it a priority. Okay, I think uh, we, you very rightly put uh, this into the global context. I think let me move to uh, Dr. James. Uh, to put the national perspective, what what is, of course, means you are working with the International Institute, you can also put the global perspective as well on this question about the state of affairs or on population stabilization. Uh, you are muted. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me for this exciting panel. Um, no, whether it is in a global perspective or Indian perspective, I think the last 10 or 20 years, if you see, there has been very substantial changes in the population front. I think demography, the scenario right now is not that much looked upon by a very pessimistic view, not even optimistic, but you can say sort of a balanced view currently. If you really look at India, India is already achieved, you can say a replacement level fertility. That means that we are very close to replacement. 2.2 is basically a replacement in India. Typically means that our population will stabilize in a couple of decades or a decade or uh, two or three decades. What does it mean? It means that we were doing some calculation because of the, the recent population policies, which has happened in the UP and other places. Even if you make the population's replacement level, achieve replacement level fertility in every state in India today, even then the population growth, the advantage in population growth, the country will get maybe a few, uh, one or two cores, not cores in the, uh, in the sense that, you know, a, a few bill, million, not even a, uh, anything substantial. It means that actually the population growth in India currently is sort of in a stabilizing mode and whatever the efforts we make, the population will grow. So we need to accept that fact. We, we have no uh, other ways to live with that fact because the population will grow up to 1.5 to 1.6 billion. And you know, it, after that, it will stabilize. I don't think that these projections are reasonably good and it, we can really trust upon them. So whatever efforts you are going to make now, that is going to happen. So you really need to plan for how to live with a 1.6 billion population, that is what perhaps the, a better strategy other than over concerning with how do we really control over it. Yes, definitely. Even if we reach uh, the TFR around 1.8 or below that, this population momentum will put it to 1.6 billion. And we have to uh, strategize ourselves uh, how to curtail this. So that's a real bottleneck. Uh, we have uh, uh, Sangamitra uh, from PFI, and they have been very actively working in Uttar Pradesh, the state of, in fact, it was Population Foundation which uh, developed the population policy of the state. So of course, uh, PFI is working uh, national level, and uh, I would like to hear from her that what is her take on this issue about the policies, the practices, and of course bottlenecks, the state of population stabilization? 
thank you, Dr. Bhuj. Um, I largely echo what uh, uh, Dr. James said that uh, um, right now our focus should really be on investing in uh, our large young population, our large population, especially those who are in the reproductive age group, because uh, as you rightly said, uh, owing to population momentum, even if uh, uh, you know our young people in their childbearing years, even if they have one or two children, the population will continue to grow till it stabilizes. I think what, uh, uh, what is really important and the uh, important aspect that needs to be addressed is the interstate and interregional variations uh, in the country, uh, as far as even fertility rates and um, health and development uh, outcomes are concerned. Four states in India contribute about 35% of India's population. Uh, UP, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, and Rajasthan. So, um, uh, you know, uh, health uh, and development investments are really the best contraceptive and the best way to really, uh, you know, serve the population. So like Dr. James rightly said, uh, our best strategy going forward is to invest in this, uh, you know, this demographic advantage that we have today and uh, make sure that our young people today, they are equipped to contribute to the uh, development of the country and contribute productively to the workforce of the country. Yes, uh, I think you very rightly said development is the best contraceptive uh, for population control and stabilization. Uh, moving to the other question uh, is that uh, regarding role of education in particular, in fact, it is also called that education is the best contraceptive. And uh, SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which are being considered as the uh, rather magic wand for the, all the development, it has emphasized, rather it has a standalone goal for about education. So it is key to sustainability of the planet, key for the development, and also key to population stabilization. So what do you consider regarding the role of education and empowerment uh, in bringing out uh, population sustainability or population stabilization or control? I think let us go to first to James, uh, like what his view on this uh, matter is. Okay, thank you. Dr. Ram, I think it is, it's a very important question because if you really look at the history of demographic changes of fertility transition, you would see two or three patterns. One is, you know, most of the Western countries achieved it through merely through economic development. You can say education is part of it, but economic growth or economic living standard improvement was the, the crux of the issue for fertility transition. But if you come to India or many developing countries, you can say the starting of the fertility transition was female education induced. You can, for instance, Kerala, you can see the classic example where it is often told, female education, female empowerment has been the crux of fertility transition in these states. But if we, if we move further, if you look at, again, Andhra Pradesh or Karnataka or even the other states in the country which achieved a fertility transition, you really don't see that close link between a female education or the fertility transition. What does it mean? It means that the state, it is because of its policies and programs, its intervention strategies, was able to even cut across those women who are illiterate, poor, etc., to accept the small family norm and the, the 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 knowledge about the small family. So the family planning has been spread across a wider sections of the population. So it means that perhaps the success story in India is this, <clears throat> the the efficiency in the service delivery in many states, which has really led to a fertility transition not perhaps the completely a root of the female education, which is supposed to be a, one of the best ways to achieve it, but we are even able to overcome it. So I don't deny that female education is not important, but I'm, I'm only telling that there are ways to achieve a population stabilization strategy beyond female education, but that doesn't no way <laughs> means that female education should be underplayed or that is very, very important for many other reasons, not even for the for population stabilization, even for the utilization of the healthcare services, everything female education becomes a critical uh, variable for many other things. So it, it only means that there are different routes to achieve a goal, perhaps beyond a female education strategy. Thank you. I think this is very interesting, Professor James. Uh, 
uh, of course, means fertility transition, which has happened in many countries, irrespective of literacy level, and rather basically uh, the effective interventions uh, at, on the field. Uh, however, in Bangladesh, for example, they used uh, education communication, particularly as one of the main instrument in bringing uh, down the family size, particularly changing the people's attitudes about family size. So, and that way, I mean, the drastic reduction in their fertility rate. So there are other examples uh, and uh, education is, have been used as most powerful tool. Uh, Dr. Sangmetra, uh, would you like to say something on this? Uh, yes. Um... I would like to add here that, of course, there's no denying the fact that education's uh, a really important uh, um, parameter and it's very, very crucial in reducing uh, fertility rates uh, in, in any country, in any context. But in the case of India, I feel like uh, social norms have a very, very crucial role in uh, determining how many children a woman has. So, you know, a woman could be educated, but the decision of how many children she's having or when she's having those children, it's not really something that is uh, always taken by her. So while education is really important, at the same time, there is a greater need of changing these, uh, you know, uh, regressive social norms, which don't really give women their own reproductive uh, autonomy. So it is a combination of uh, these two factors. And I mean, education is really, really important, but in the social cultural context of the country, um, I think, uh, you know, effective social behavior change communication strategies to change mindsets of people to, uh, you know, promote greater male engagement and family planning, several other such strategies are required to, uh, to bring down fertility levels. I think I well said it. It's a socio a cultural uh, milieu in which uh, the women or the men they live. That's a, a deciding factor. Uh, Terry, uh, I think you are the one who has been using the education and communication as one of the best tools for communicating messages of uh, population. So I, we would like to hear from you. Well, I, I thank you, Dr. Bush, and I, I would agree that uh, uh, with both uh, uh, of you all that, uh, you know, uh, Western countries certainly have a lower fertility rate. The United States is now below replacement it's been for a number of years. And so uh, for, for uh, our country, uh, it's really about educating about the connection of uh, the impacts of uh, population growth on the environment. And uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Singh was saying there, having you know, the, the social norms are critical and uh, what uh, uh, the education from uh, towards the Western world needs to be is that, you know, having one or no children is by far the most profound action an individual can take towards fixing climate change and healing the environment. Um, small families must become the symbol of parents who really care about the climate, uh, about the environment and about the well-being of future generations. And uh, those social norms can be changed quite rapidly. And, uh, you know, when they're intentional groups like the Mobius Foundation and what we're doing at Earth Overshoot, you know, executing on strategic campaigns. Uh, you know, we've seen it happen in many countries, uh, uh, certainly empowering and enabling women to, you know, uh, get an education, gain reproductive autonomy is step number one. But, you know, when they have that fertility rate that is coming down to below replacement, uh, there has to be that connection made with the environment as well. Uh, that uh, it's critical. It's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's just a, you know it's fundamental to you know, the future uh, for our children and uh, uh, you know long term sustainability. Uh, thank you, Terry. Uh, very interesting education and communication as one of the most effective tools. Let us uh, know what uh, our viewers uh, have to say. We have two very interesting questions. Uh, let us put them for polling. What, what is the general opinion? So can, can we have those polling questions? Yes, question one is related to uh, what you said uh, in, in the beginning. Yes, this is what is. So we have, uh, you can just go through these questions and you will be given, of course, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. That means uh, 
a minute for each question. So population is declining globally. Even China is reversing its one child policy. India too has TFR close to 1.8 in 18 of 29 states like Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, fall be, uh, they fall behind. Do you think this that population is still a problem? A is yes, two is B is no, C is of course means a kind of countries must reap the population dividend and D none of the above. So your time starts now. So time is up. So can you show the results simultaneously? Oh my God. <laughs> yes, it's 100% what we have been telling. Population stabilization is needed in order to reduce pressure on limited resources. Our audience is very, very clear, no doubt. Thank you, audience. Can we move to question number two? Education is the key for population stabilization. However, more than education, provision of contraceptives, counseling, and medical health outreach are critical for achieving population stabilization. What, in your opinion, is the best approach? Strict population control law, providing incentives and disincentives for limiting family size, provision of family planning services like easy access to contraceptives, C, education and empowerment of girl, child, inclusion of male in family planning. D, all the above. So, I think you can, yes, your time starts now. Oh, our audience are very clear. All the above 50%. And uh, about the strict law, again, half of the people. So I think these are the, the conclusions of uh, the audience. And uh, we would definitely like to hear uh, from our experts. What, in your opinion, should be the way forward for effective use of education and communication in creating awareness about population issues on the one hand, and overall, your recommendation? The last question, and uh, I think quickly, if you can just uh, conclude with, with the, your recommendations. Terry. Um. With uh, that question there, uh, Dr. Bouj, I, I, I think we have to be careful not to repeat the mistakes of the past and uh, the, you know, the, 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 all the different uh, measures that one can take are, to me, along a spectrum of uh, what is considered moral in society. So uh, I do think we need to influence uh, decisions, and that comes through education, it comes through incentives, incentives, but I think we have to be very careful about going down a path where we uh, inhibit or prohibit uh, reproductive autonomy. Um, I, I, you know, many countries have done marvelous jobs at uh, you know influencing the population curve and their fertility curve all through voluntary, uh, non-coercive means. And uh, I, I don't think uh, I think that can be done and 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 uh, and replicated. It's been done in many countries, as we all know, on the on the call here. 
And I'm not concerned about, and I saw no one was really concerned about the economy. They, there are many, many countries that have gone through you know, population decline, uh, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Ukraine, Croatia, Georgia, Pol uh, Poland, Portugal, and uh, there are a couple other ones I'm missing, Romania. And all these are um, uh, gently declining, but their economies are doing very well. So, you know, we can do this. We can do it with, all in a human rights context, all voluntarily. And I think uh, uh, just a, it's a matter of really marshalling our forces together uh, in our countries and as a global society to confront this head on and have an honest, open, forthright conversation and to take the stigma away from it. Yes, I think yes, voluntary non-coercive and of course means through educating awareness and interventions. Uh, Professor James. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would also go with Terry on this aspect because Incentives and disincentives are tried out in India on different contexts in different states at different time points in time. But we found that you know even those states which have not adopted any of these incentives and disincentives had much success, big success stories in controlling population compared to those states which has gone for disincentives, including electoral disincentives and many other disincentives. So it is obviously voluntary. That is what the country committed in. 1994 in the uh, Cairo conference, so which ICPD conference, naturally country has to go with that kind of uh, approach to controlling population. The second is that there is also something called the irreversibility of demographic changes. So demographic changes are supposed to be reversible. Once you achieve a low fertility, it is very, very unlikely and there is no history at all to that, that, that can be reversed uh, and can make it a big higher fertility, which China is now struggling with most of us believes that they will not be successful. So it means that a very rapid transition from a very high fertility to next day low fertility is also not good because that completely changes the age structure, which will give a very, very unscientific age structure for unsustainable age structure for any country. So a, it has to be relatively faster, but it cannot be you know, in the completely altering the a structure of the population. So that will also create. And thirdly, the finally, I think the education definitely undoubtedly is important, but education currently has to be emphasized to improve the quality of the population because the quality in terms of their healthcare services in, uh, in service delivery, uh, achieving much better service delivery and also achieving the a balanced sex ratio. And there are many other aspects in India needs where actually education become will going to play a vital, vital role. So I think emphasis on education should be on, not purely on controlling population, but to ensure the quality of our population. That should be our emphasis in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting. I think your conclusion, uh, education for bringing out quality uh, element into the population, uh, both stabilization, control, and of course, means ensuring a sustainable lifestyle as well. So with that, may I move to Sangmitra also for uh, her views, uh, the concluding views? Um, yeah, um, thank you, Dr. Buj. I would like to say that, uh, you know, uh, going forward, we need to make sure that we put people before numbers. I know that the numbers are increasing, <laughs> but people are more important. You know, we have a population. You know, we have to invest in them. We have to, uh, uh, you know, take measures which are not going to be detrimental to a specific population group. For instance, you know, earlier we talked about um, gender inequality in the country. Uh, you know, any kind of coercive measure when, it, when it's implemented, it has the greatest impact on women. Women are the ones who uh, suffer the most. You know, in the past also certain states which have implemented incentives and disincentives that you know, like panchayat levels, they have seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, an increase in sex sele selective abortions, women, uh, uh, you know, women being deserted by their husbands so that the husbands can contest panchayat elections, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, increase in, I, I already mentioned sex sele selective abortions in the past also. So there is, you know, limited literature though to support this. So, uh, and, and, you know, we must not forget that we live in a country where there is extreme sun preference. So, uh, you know, people will continue to have uh, children till they have desired number of sons. 
so you know in such a scenario when you implement a coercive uh, you know policy and if you attach incentives to people who have two children you must understand that their mindset has not changed so they would still want to have one son between those two children that they have and what would that automatically result in it would result in more uh, you know unsafe abortions or sex selective selective abortions in the country which are not really being uh you know documented largely also so um you know it's very very important to uh, change social norms to invest in gender equality to promote the value of the girl child and invest in family planning i i feel like that's that's really really important to uh you know to to uh, promote the use of uh, um contraceptives among both our male and female population we have a large young population so we need to promote the use of uh, spacing methods you know the our demographic doesn't quite align with the high usage of uh, um, or high prevalence of sterilization in the country though that is changing now uh, gradually as we've seen with the first phase of nfhs5 so there are i mean this whole population issue it, it's a complex one but we must not forget that uh, you know in this number game we must not forget uh, people is what i would like to say thank you yes i think you rightly said uh... Uh, in conclusion of course our uh, title of the theme of our this session was also people versus planet so let us let, let this program be humanist approach people centric and uh, not numbers it's quality and particularly when we try to limit those numbers uh, there are the most uh, worst sufferer are the, the women uh in terms of gender imbalance and equality so that way uh, i think thank you very much all the panelists we would uh, turn to mr pradeep barman uh, for his concluding remarks he has listened very carefully and over the many years he single handedly i when i joined movius foundation i was not uh, very much convinced about uh, uh, his uh, a zeal for uh, this population stabilization and uh, but ultimately i i am now one of the uh, uh, staunchest advocates of this whole crusade or the mo movement that he has launched so mr berman we are very keen to hear from you well, thank you dr buj i think uh, from all the panelists we've heard quite uh, different kinds of views on how to tackle the uh, population uh, which is damaging the planet so uh, i think uh, it's it's good to have all different kinds of views on on what uh, we should be doing uh, about the population because population is the problem as far as population multiplied by our consumption and by our lifestyle is really the issue in today's lifestyle we have we let's have a look uh, at the population in 1900 was 1.6 billion today it is close to 8 billion that is five times in 100 years of the whole uh, you know history of mankind in 100 years we have gone five times the population and that is essentially the problem so i think the major issue has to be making people aware of this fact that population multiplied by uh, the consumption pattern is causing damage to the environment and will lead us to the end and it needs action needs to be taken now now what is the action to be taken as various uh, things have been suggested by the panelists but if the reason why the planet is deteriorating is linked essentially to the population i think more people will understand whatever action you take to limit the population people will understand number 2 i think we should have a look at different positions or different uh, scenarios as far as each country is concerned each country has a different 
issue its various population is concerned as was already mentioned by uh, the panelists uh, that the developed countries let's say like uh, uh, the us and uh, uh, the especially the northern uh, most countries like sweden finland uh, and uh, uh, the third country there that their population is actually going down so india has a different set of problems and which is similar to what bangladesh has and similar to what china has so these are the three main contributors uh, to uh, the population and why it is so high i would like someone to study as to what is the proper population that the the, the planet should have so that the planet can survive and the humans can survive now this has to do with the current lifestyle and with the changes that we have to make uh, to uh, to uh, to support a larger population for example if you have a look at the electric cars in the electric cars if we have uh, which is a major cause of uh, the the pollution and the climate change and the rest of the things that we are doing uh, the if it is brought down to the level uh, perhaps a great amount of uh, uh, the damage that we are doing to the earth can be uh, done now uh, these things are already being taken and they need to be taken uh, and uh, adopted by all the countries uh, that are have these electric cars two i think that uh, voluntary is uh, voluntary limits and and in india itself distribution of contraceptives is the most important thing what we found in the rural areas that the the, the women want to control their population uh, stabilize the population but then they don't have the contraceptives to do so so distribution of the contraceptives in that particular region is very important so each region will have to ha have its own ways of limiting the population and it will have to be voluntary the one of the problems that does arise every time we ask ourselves is the development versus uh, the e economy or development versus environment and there is no question at all that we should propagate that environment comes first otherwise development goes all to zero because the planet cannot survive that's a point which not people are taking up i think it was mentioned by one of the panelists uh, that we are looking at development and we're looking at gdp but we're not looking at every percentage of gdp that goes up what extra damage it does to the environment so any particular thing that we uh, any new project that we do or we 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 increase the gdp how much damage does it do to the environment and, and that is the limiting factor for our development that must be taken into account by all governments i think uh, the governments have to take a much greater role and that can only be done by public pressure and that is why i mentioned the role in what is happening in the in the uk is the xr movement uh, which is a mass movement which will uh, which will actually force governments to to take a role in looking at uh, the environment degradation and that is what we should look at besides looking just at the population itself because population whatever we do it takes about 100 years before uh, we can reach our desired goal so these are some of the things i've randomly shot off uh, which i think are important as far as uh, the uh, the survival of the planet is concerned so thank you uh, dr buj i have a lot more things to say but then 
we don't have enough time to do it. So it might sound a little disjointed, whatever I have said, but uh, I tried to cover as many things as I could. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Berman. I think uh, you made your point very well uh, in a very brief time. Uh, we really have uh, limited time, but uh, this session we could finish in, I think, uh, almost slightly. Uh, uh, it was up to 4.30, I think, uh, but uh, started late, but we could finish uh, well within whatever time we had. So thank you so much, all our uh, distinguished uh, panelists, uh, Terry Spar, uh, K.S. James, Sangamitra, uh, for your very, I think uh, these were very, very inspiring as well as very educative. And we will definitely approach you further for your inputs uh, when we uh, do the proceedings of this, because this we there are keen interest by line ministries and many more in this particular session and many are watching it. And uh, I could see that there was almost close to 150 uh, interest earlier out of 500 registered. So a lot of interest was in this in this session. So very interesting session. And I think you all could contribute very meaningfully to all those questions that were raised. And in fact, audience participation was very, very useful. In fact, we could know what people think about some of these issues. So thank you so much. And let us all move to the concluding plenary straightway, where leaders of other groups will come up with their conclusions. So we, you can just sign off from this session and rejoin the plenary. Thank you, Dr. Bush. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.